Section 17 of Three Years in Europe, or Places I Have Seen and People I Have Met. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Three Years in Europe, or Places I Have Seen and People I Have Met, by William Wells Brown. Letter 17. A Day in the Crystal Palace London, June 27th, 1851 Presuming that you will expect from me some account of the great world's fair, I take my pen to give you my own impressions, although I am afraid that anything which I may say about this lion of the day will fall far short of a description. On Monday last, I quitted my lodgings at an early hour, and started for the Crystal Palace. This day was fine, such as we seldom experience in London, with a clear sky and invigorating air, whose vitality was as rousing to the spirits as a blast from the horn of Astolfo. Although it was not yet ten o'clock when I entered Piccadilly, every omnibus was full, inside and out and the street was lined with one living stream as far as the eye could reach, all wending their way to the glass-house. No metropolis in the world presents such facilities as London for the reception of the great exhibition, now collected within its walls. Throughout its myriads of veins, the stream of industry and toil pulses with sleepless energy. Everyone seems to feel that this great capital of the world is the fittest place wherein they might offer homage to the dignity of toil. I had already begun to feel fatigued by my pedestrian excursion as I passed Apsley House, the residence of the Duke of Wellington, and emerged into Hyde Park. I had hoped that on getting into the park I would be out of the crowd that seemed to press so heavily in the street. But in this I was mistaken. I here found myself surrounded by, and moving with, an overwhelming mass, such as I had never before witnessed. And, away in the distance, I beheld a dense crowd, and above every other object was seen the lofty summit of the Crystal Palace. The drive in the park was lined with princely-looking vehicles of every description. The drivers in their bright red and gold uniforms, the pages and footmen in their blue trousers and white silk stockings, and the horses, dressed up in their neat silver-mounted harness, made the scene altogether one of great splendor. I was soon at the door, paid my shilling, and entered the building at the south end of the transept. For the first ten or twenty minutes, I was so lost in astonishment and absorbed in pleasing wonder that I could do nothing but gaze up and down the vista of the noble building. The Crystal Palace resembles in some respects the interior of the cathedrals of this country. One long avenue from east to west is intersected by a transept which divides the building into two nearly equal parts. This is the greatest building the world ever saw before which the pyramids of Egypt and the Colossus of Rhodes must hide their diminished heads. The palace was not full at any time during the day, there being only sixty-four thousand persons present. Those who love to study the human countenance in all its infinite varieties can find ample scope for the indulgence of their taste by a visit to the World's Fair. All countries are there represented, Europeans, Asiatics, Americans and Africans, with their numerous subdivisions. Even the exclusive Chinese, with his hair braided and hanging down his back, has left the land of his nativity, and is seen making long strides through the Crystal Palace, in his wooden-bottomed shoes. Of all places of curious costumes and different fashions, none has ever yet presented such a variety as this exhibition. No dress is too absurd to be worn in this place. There is a great deal of freedom in the exhibition. The servant who walks behind his mistress through the park feels that he can crowd against her in the exhibition. The queen and the day-laborer, the prince and the merchant, the peer and the pauper, the Celt and the Saxon, the Greek and the Frank, the Hebrew and the Russ, all meet here upon terms of perfect equality. 
this amalgamation of rank this kindly blending of interests and forgetfulness of the cold formalities of ranks and grades cannot but be attended with the very best results i was pleased to see such a goodly sprinkling of my own countrymen in the exhibition i mean colored men and women well dressed and moving about with their fairer brethren this some of our pro-slavery americans did not seem to relish very well there was no help for it as i walked through the american part of the crystal palace some of our virginian neighbors eyed me closely and with jealous looks especially as an english lady was leaning on my arm but their sneering looks did not disturb me in the least i remained the longer in their department and criticized the bad appearance of their goods the more indeed the americans as far as appearance goes are behind every other country in the exhibition the greek slave is the only production of art which the united states has sent and it would have been more to their credit had they kept that at home in so vast a place as the great exhibition one scarcely knows what to visit first or what to look upon last after wandering about through the building for five hours i sat down in one of the galleries and looked at the fine marble statue of virginius with the knife in his hand and about to take the life of his beloved and beautiful daughter to save her from the hands of appius claudius the admirer of genius will linger for hours among the great variety of statues in the long avenue large statues of lords eldon and stowell carved out of solid marble each weighing above twenty tons are among the most gigantic in the building i was sitting with my four hundred paged guide-book before me and looking down upon the moving mass when my attention was called to a small group of gentlemen standing near the statue of shakespeare one of whom wore a white coat and hat and had flaxen hair and trousers rather short in the legs the lady by my side and who had called my attention to the group asked if i could tell what country this odd-looking gentleman was from not wishing to run the risk of a mistake i was about declining to venture an opinion when the reflection of the sun against a mirror on the opposite side threw a brilliant light upon the group and especially on the face of the gentleman in the white coat and i immediately recognized under the brim of the white hat the features of horace greeley esq of the new york tribune his general appearance was as much out of the english style as that of the turk whom i had seen but a moment before in his bag-like trousers shuffling along in his slippers but oddness in dress is one of the characteristics of the great exhibition among the many things in the crystal palace there are some which receive greater attention than others around which may always be seen large groups of the visitors the first of these is the koinor the mountain of light this is the largest and most valuable diamond in the world said to be worth two million pounds sterling it is indeed a great source of attraction to those who go to the exhibition for the first time but it is doubtful whether it obtains such admiration afterwards we saw more than one spectator turn away with the idea that after all it was only a piece of glass after some jamming i got a look at the precious jewel and although in a brass grated cage strong enough to hold a lion i found it to be no larger than the third of a hen's egg two policemen remained by its side day and night the finest thing in the exhibition is the veiled vestal a statue of a woman carved in marble with a veil over her face and so neatly done that it looks as if it had been thrown over after it was finished the exhibition presents many things which appeal to the eye and touch the heart and altogether it is so decorated and furnished as to excite the dullest mind and satisfy the most fastidious england has contributed the most useful and substantial articles france the most beautiful while russia turkey and the west indies seem to vie with each other in richness china and persia are not behind austria has also contributed a rich and beautiful stock sweden norway denmark and the smaller states of europe have all tried to outdo themselves in sending goods to the world's fair in machinery england has no competitor in art 
France is almost alone in the exhibition, setting aside England. In natural productions and provisions, America stands alone in her glory. There lies her pile of canvassed hams, whether they were wood or real, we could not tell. There are her barrels of salt, beef, and pork, her beautiful white lard, her Indian corn and cornmeal, her rice and tobacco, her beef tongues, dried peas, and a few bags of cotton. The contributors from the United States seem to have forgotten that this was an exhibition of art, or they most certainly would not have sent provisions. But the United States takes the lead in the contributions, as no other country has sent in provisions. The finest thing contributed by our countrymen is a large piece of silk with an eagle painted upon it, surrounded by stars and stripes. After remaining more than five hours in the great temple, I turned my back upon the richly laden stalls and left the Crystal Palace. On my return home, I was more fortunate than in the morning, inasmuch as I found a seat for my friend and myself in an omnibus, and even my ride in the close omnibus was not without interest, for I had scarcely taken my seat when my friend, who was seated opposite me, with looks and gesture informed me that we were in the presence of some distinguished person. I eyed the countenances of the different persons, but in vain, to see if I could find any one who, by his appearance, showed signs of superiority over his fellow passengers. I had given up the hope of selecting the person of note when another look from my friend directed my attention to a gentleman seated in the corner of the omnibus. He was a tall man with strongly marked features, hair dark and coarse. There was a slight stoop of the shoulder, that bend which is almost always a characteristic of studious men. But he wore upon his countenance a forbidding and disdainful frown that seemed to tell one that he thought himself better than those about him. His dress did not indicate a man of high rank, and had we been in America, I would have taken him for an Ohio farmer. While I was scanning the features and general appearance of the gentleman, the omnibus stopped and put down three or four of the passengers, which gave me an opportunity of getting a seat by the side of my friend, who, in a low whisper, informed me that the gentleman whom I had been eyeing so closely was no less a person than Thomas Carlyle. I had read his hero-worship, and past and present, and had formed a high opinion of his literary abilities. But his recent attack upon the emancipated people of the West Indies, and his laborious article in favor of the re-establishment of the lash and slavery, had created in my mind a dislike for the man, and I almost regretted that we were in the same omnibus. In some things Mr. Carlyle is right, but in many he is entirely wrong. As a writer, Mr. Carlyle is often monotonous and extravagant. He does not exhibit a new view of nature, or raise insignificant objects into importance, but generally takes commonplace thoughts and events, and tries to express them in stronger and statelier language than others. He holds no communion with his kind, but stands alone without mate or fellow. He is like a solitary peak, all access to which is cut off. He exists not by sympathy, but by antipathy. Mr. Carlyle seems chiefly to try how he shall display his own powers and astonish mankind, by starting new trains of speculation or by expressing old ones so as not to be understood. He cares little what he says, so as he can say it differently from others. To read his works is one thing, to understand them is another. If any one thinks that I exaggerate, let him sit for an hour over Sartre Resartus, and if he does not rise from its pages, place his three or four dictionaries on the shelf, and say, I am right, I promise never again to say a word against Thomas Carlyle. He writes one page in favor of reform, and ten against it. He would hang all prisoners to get rid of them, yet the inmates of the prisons and workhouses are better off than the poor. His heart is with the poor, yet the blacks of the West Indies should be taught that if they will not raise sugar and cotton by their own free will, Quashi should have the whip applied to him. 
he frowns upon the reformatory speakers upon the boards of Exeter Hall, yet he is the prince of reformers. He hates heroes and assassins, yet Cromwell was an angel, and Charlotte Corday a saint. He scorns everything, and seems to be tired of what he is by nature, and tries to be what he is not. But you will ask, what has Thomas Carlyle to do with a visit to the Crystal Palace? My only reply is, nothing. And if my remarks upon him have taken up the space that should have been devoted to the exhibition, and what I have written not prove too burdensome to read, my next will be a week in the Crystal Palace. End of letter 17. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista.